Lecture 22 is going to be in one lecture. We are reviewing for the exam on Wednesday. I want to start the review by reviewing antiderivatives and talk about the application of antiderivatives. We should be able to not just differentiate on exam two, but also do some basic antiderivatives. Then I also want to review implicit differentiation. Look at an application to what I call sensitivity analysis of yield rates for bonds. The example I'm going to do is, is fairly complicated, but it's the bigger idea that you want to focus on. Not necessarily the exact details of the calculations, though again, you can check those out in class. We barely talked about last Friday the increasing function theorem, the decreasing function theorem, and the constant function theorem. I want to review those and talk about applications and what you should know on those for exam two. And then we'll do a more general review for exam two. So please stop me anytime you want to ask questions. <coughs> so first we're looking at an application of antiderivatives, probably the most basic kind of application, free fall under the influence of gravity. Assume that the only force acting on a falling object is the force due to gravity. In other words, all other forces are negligible. Of course, there's other forces, the most prominent being air resistance. Though this is roughly going to be true for objects like stones that are moving at relatively low speeds. The gravity force overwhelms the force of air resistance in that situation, and you can essentially ignore air resistance. If you had something falling in a vacuum, then you wouldn't have to worry about air resistance either, even for a feather. If the upward direction is taken to be positive, you can use Newton's second law to show that the acceleration is constant. Here's a quick, quick little derivation of that. The downward force due to gravity is negative mg, where m is the mass of the object. Newton's second law says that equals mass times acceleration, ma. But the m's cancel. And you're left saying the acceleration is negative g, about negative 9.8 meters per second per second, which is typically written meters per second squared. That's a constant function for the acceleration. It's a constant acceleration. What would we like to find from this? We'd like to find the velocity and maybe the height of the object. We know the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. That's definitely something you should know for exam two. So to find the velocity, we've got to go backwards. We have to anti-differentiate. Integrate. The velocity, which is also the derivative of the height with respect to time, is the integral of the acceleration, this constant negative g with respect to time. The dt here emphasizes we're integrating with respect to time. t is the variable. So when you integrate a constant, that's the simplest kind of integral to do. Like if you were integrating 17 dt, you'd be looking for um, the most general function whose derivative is the constant 17. 17 t is certainly one of them. You can also add in a constant. That would be the most general antiderivative of the function 17. It's not a 17 here, it's a negative g. It's a negative 9.8 approximately, but the idea is the same. You're going to get negative gt plus c. The c happens to equal the initial velocity as well. That's why you see the v sub 0 here. Why? Well, if you replace t with 0, you get 0 plus c, you get c. Replace t with zero means to find the initial velocity. C must be the initial velocity. Did you catch that? If you think of d as a function of t, call it g of t, and write it as negative, well, that would be a bad way to choose. Call it, um, I'll call it f of t. Negative g t plus c. We know the initial velocity is typically labeled v sub zero. That would be the same as the function value at zero. 
which is going to be 0 plus c over c, c must be the same as the initial velocity. C is not really arbitrary unless you consider the initial velocity to be arbitrary. This could help you, for example, figure out when the velocity is zero. Set this equal to zero and solve for t. Can you do that in your head? What would you get? If I set this equal to zero, and solve for t, what would you get? I'm saying? C over 17. I'm dealing with the d symbols oh, here. Oh, oh. Subtract v0 from both sides. Divide both sides by negative g. Right. You get v0 over g. The negative signs would cancel. That would be the time when the velocity is zero, assuming v0 is positive. Assuming you throw it upwards to begin with. Upwards is positive. That's how long it's going to take to reach the peak. Then you could also find the maximum height by plugging it back into the height function, which we haven't found yet. Come back to the screen here. This is the derivative of the height with respect to t. We have to integrate again to find the height. Integrate the velocity. Integrate the negative gt plus this constant v sub 0 with respect to t. The dt emphasizes you want to think of t as the variable. So think about this. What's a function whose derivative is negative g times t? So to reverse the power rule, the, the exponent on the t has to go up by 1 instead of down by 1. This is anti-differentiation. We'd also have to divide by 2, and you can check that. It takes a little bit of experimentation. Just double check this. Differentiate this. You bring down the 2. It would cancel with that 2. So we have a negative g times t to the first power, which is exactly what we have there. v0 is just a constant. You integrate that, you get v0 times t. Plus c. This time, c happens to be the initial height. Because when you plug in t equals 0 here, you get 0 plus c again. That has to be the initial height. C equals h0. So if you wanted to find the maximum height, which I could ask you to do on the exam, you then want to take this expression for the time of the maximum height, assuming, again, that v0 is positive. So you've thrown it upwards. If you throw it straight downwards or if you drop it, there is no maximum height, except, well, if you drop it, the maximum height is at time 0. Or if you throw it We're more interested in the case where v0 is positive. The graph of h with respect to t looks like an upside down parabola. The location of the vertex here is at v0 over g, that value of t. You would plug it into the height function to find out the maximum height. Plug in v0 over g here. I won't take the time to do that, but that's what you would do. You should be able to handle it in this general situation, but you also should be able to handle it with numbers. If I give you the numbers question. What section is this in? Um, well, they talk about applications like this sort of throughout chapter 2 and chapter 3. So it's not really in any particular section. We have talked, at the beginning of chapter 2, they talked about speed and velocity and that kind of thing. And then we talked about acceleration when we talked about second derivatives. But these, this kind of problem solving is sort of woven throughout the second <coughs> derivative. We talked about it to some degree in class already. Um, and I'm saying it again, but I should be able to do it. Okay. So how do we practice? Go ahead and pick some numbers. Or even just do it right now. Okay, maybe I should do it right now. You should be able to do what I'm showing you. You can just go ahead and pick some numbers and do the exact same kind of problem solving. So if you want to find the maximum height, all this k of t, just searching for letters here, the maximum height, since the time of the maximum height is this time, can be found just by plugging that thing into this function for the height. Don't be bothered by the fact that I'm calling it the function k. I'm just looking for a letter to use. 
plug that in place of t. Get negative g over 2, v0 over g quantity squared, plus v0 times v0 over g, plus h term. And then you just simplify. Okay? And again, with, you can come up with your own examples when you're you plug in particular numbers here. Let's go ahead and simplify it. Um, I think I'd like to combine all of those fractions into one, so I need to get a common denominator of 2 times g. The first one already has a denominator of 2g. The second one I need to multiply to the top and the bottom by 2. And the last one I need to multiply h0 by, by 2g on the top and the bottom, so to speak. Yeah, thanks. Let's do this. Okay, one of those G's cancels. g is our common denominator there. Negative v0 squared plus 2v0 squared plus, this looks better, 2gh0 divided by 2g. These two things combine and it looks like we're going to get v0 squared plus 2gh0 over 2g. Okay. So a symbolic representation, if I've not made any other mistakes, for the maximum height, how high it goes. Again, you should be able to deal with this with particular numbers as well. If I give you an initial velocity and an initial height, you should be able to do the same kind of thing. Right? Does that make sense? Just plug in the time of the maximum height into the height function to get the maximum height. That's all we're doing. Okay. Just plug things into functions. <coughs> what I'm about to show you is more complicated. And it's probably best to just listen, okay? <coughs> Though when I do some of the calculations, you should think about how that would work with simpler examples. But this is a honest to goodness real life application of implicit differentiation. So I thought it was worth showing you. It's also good to review the idea of a bond. I didn't put the idea of a bond in exam one. I might in exam two, but I would I would tell you what to do. Okay, so you don't need to worry about trying to think about bonds from scratch. I'll give you help. Here's here's the example. Suppose a three-year, thousand-dollar redemption value bond with annual coupon payments of forty dollars is purchased for nine hundred fifty dollars. So I mentioned what a bond was about a month ago or so. Bond for you is an investment. Whoever you're giving your money to as your investment is the person who is essentially issuing debt. It's usually not a person, it's usually a government, like the federal government. It's part of the federal government's debt is in bonds. Or a state government, or a local government, or a company. Companies issue bonds. Well, that's how, sometimes how they raise money, it's not just stocks. And when you say the redemption value is $1,000, that means after three years, you're going to get $1,000 back as part of your $950 investment at time zero. But you're going to get more than $1,000 three years later. You're also going to get what are called coupons, annual coupons of $40. So you're going to get $40 at the end of the first year, $40 at the end of the second year. And then at the end of the third year, you're going to get $40 plus $1,000, $1,040. You want to know what kind of interest rate you're getting, essentially. That's called the yield rate. And it's a way to compare different investments. You want higher yield rates. We're going to find the yield rate here. And we're also going to do what's called analyze the sensitivity of the yield rate to changes in the coupon payments and the purchase price at the given coupon payment and purchase values. What do I mean by that? To analyze the sensitivity means, essentially, to take the derivative of it the derivative of the yield rate with respect to 
the price of the bond, or the coupon loss. How sensitive is the yield rate to changes, to small changes in the price away from 950 or the coupon months away from 40? They change a little bit. How do they affect the yield rate? Remember to solve for the yield rate, you want to equate what are called future values of outgoing and incoming payments. So here's a number line with times on it. 0, 1, 2, and 3. You have outgoing money, and you have incoming money. The outgoing money is your initial investment. That, that's $950 at time zero. That's what you pay right away. But then there's incoming money. There's coupon payments, $40 at time one, $40 at time two, and $40 at time three, plus this redemption amount. So the total you get at time three is $1,040. So you're getting $1,120 on your $950 investment. But you're getting these amounts at different times, and so that affects the yield rate. It's not as simple as it could be otherwise. But what you want to do is you want to think about compound interest and essentially take these amounts and see what they're worth at time three push them forward in time to time three. This 950 needs to go three years into the future to find its future value. The $40 there needs to go two more years into the future, and the $40 there needs to go one more year into the future. The 1,040 is already at time three. We don't need to do anything with that. Here's how you equate. That's the future value of the initial payment you made. I just multiply by one plus I do the third power. It's essentially compound interest. With n, the compounding taking the one. So it's a way you can model it. 950 is your investment, it's your principal. That's the future value of your investment, outgoing money. This is the future value of your income money. The $40 at time one needs to go forward two years. The $40 at time two needs to go forward one year. There's a first power here. And the 1,040 at time three is already at time three. So the goal here is now to solve for i, to find the yield rate. It's a cubic in i. There technically is a formula for solving cubics, but it's so complicated we never teach it. Okay? So it would be fine just to use technology here, and I did, and I got this for the yield rate, about 5.866%. And you can check that with your calculator. You should be able to check that with your calculator. You can graph this function and this function and see where they intersect. Of course, in your calculator, you'd use an X instead of not. I is playing the role of X. But I want to do more now. I want to analyze the sensitivity. For example, I might want to differentiate this a certain function with respect to, say, the price. Instead of writing this equation and just solving for i, I could write this general equation where p is the purchase price and c is the coupon amount, 1,000 is the redemption value, and differentiate i with respect to, say, p in this equation. I've really got three variables here, an i, a p, and a c. I'm wondering, how does the derivative of i depend on, well, what is the derivative of i with respect to p, for example? And if I can find that, that's going to help me know how the interest rate is going to be affected. The yield rate will be affected by small changes in the price. Does that make sense? Because it's going to be a derivative of i with respect to p. Now, to solve for that derivative, you need to use implicit differentiation. We're not solving for i explicitly, so we have to use implicit differentiation. Let me just do it by hand here. And I got it on the screen. Differentiate with respect to P, essentially. Treating the C like a constant. I is the dependent variable. Think about 
about over here. You're differentiating this with respect to P. There's a P there. I'm thinking of I as depending on P. I'm thinking of this as a function of P. I of P, if you prefer. Or I equals F of P, if you prefer. I've got the product, really, then, of two functions of P. I need the product. Lefty right plus righty left. Right. left here, that's your left function, there's your right function. Left, it's just itself. D right, I need to differentiate the right one. With respect to P, I is a function of P. I need the chain rule there. I've got an inside function, 1 plus I, and an outside function, the cumulative function. Bring down the 3, subtract 1 from the exponent, then multiply times the derivative of the inside function with respect to P. That's the quantity I'm after, the IDP. I'm using partial derivative notation to emphasize there are many variables here. But I would be okay with it if you use ordinary different, um, ordinary derivative notation like that. That would be, that would be fine as well. It's just notation to emphasize the variables here. That's all that is. I'm now done with the product rule here. That's lefty right. I also need righty left. The derivative of p with respect to p is just 1. There's right to e left. On the right side, I'm treating the c like a constant. I'm just going to carry it along in these two things when I differentiate. Bring down the 2, subtract 1 from the exponent, multiply times the derivative of the inside. You just got to keep your wits about you. I'm differentiating with respect to p. I'm treating c as a constant. Do the same kind of thing there. The C just gets carried along for the ride. The derivative of 1 plus I with respect to P is that symbol. And here, this is an honest-to-goodness constant. I differentiate that, I get 0. Because I'm treating C like a constant. If I were differentiating with respect to C, I'd treat P as a constant. So this is an algebraic equation you would solve for di dt. And I've got it on the screen. I'm not going to bother doing it on the board. There's the derivatives I just did. Double check things, make sure it's right. Solve for the IDP. How? It's algebra. It's messy algebra, but it is just algebra. You want to get all the DIDP terms on one side and all the terms that don't involve the IDP on the other side. There's the only term, uh, here's the only term, excuse me, that does not involve the derivative of I with respect to P. Bring it over to the other side, say, side, say with the negative sign. I want to subtract these from the right side, bring them over to the left, and factor out the DIDP. I'm confident if you were careful and check this on your own, you would get this exact same answer. And with the negative sign that I had out in front, I sort of distribute it through the bottom, is what I ended up doing. It's complicated, but it's doable. Okay, maybe not an exam because an exam is too pressure field filled. But it's the idea that's important to you. And you could do it if you were careful enough. If you were listening carefully enough to what I'm saying about how to think about it. Okay, I am giving you the exact same, the exact right way to think about it. It's confusing, but you have to take the time to think about it carefully. As far as figuring out the sensitivity now, just plug in the numbers. Plug in the numbers from this part. 950 from P for P, 40 for C, and 0.058659.1 for I. Evaluate that derivative. You can check in your own <coughs> that you're going to get this number. It's negative. What does that tell you? That tells you as P increases, I decreases. As the price of the bond goes up from 950, to something slightly higher, 951, 952, 960 maybe, the yield rate's going to go down. It's a negative derivative. And this tells you how fast it goes down. It's a rate of change. Let me show you what I mean in mathematica. By the way, here's the code I use in mathematics to solve for i, to solve for that yield rate. 
here it is. Ignore the complex yield rates, those don't make any real life sense. They are solutions of the cubic, but this is the one we want. Is I truly a function of P and C? You can actually graph it. I wouldn't expect you to know how to do this, but you can actually graph it in three-dimensional space with the p-axis going to the right here, and a c-axis going into the screen, and an i-axis going up and down. This red dot represents the solution when p is 950 and c is 40. That was the investment amount. Purchase price, 40 was the coupon payment. The yield rate, I, is where that red dot is. It's at a height of about, what was it, 0 0.05 something? I'm interested in the rate of change of I with respect to P or C. Slopes of this in certain directions. Actually, the calculation we did was a slope with respect to the P direction, to the right. It's a negative slope. That's why we got a negative derivative. And we can confirm, this is just calculations that, uh, I'm not going to explain these, that confirm the exact same answer we just got, the negative 0.00039 for the derivative there. Don't worry about how I did that. What is this telling us? Let's imagine P changing from 950 to 960. So the, the change in P is 10. What would be the corresponding change in I? This is linearization. I've emphasized a lot. Okay, this, I'm about to say something I've emphasized a lot. To find this approximately, take the derivative times the change in the independent variable. I've said that many, many times. Take the derivative of I with respect to P, evaluate it at the given point, times the change in P. This is, remember the first, day, first lecture? This is a generalization of distance equals rate times time. I said all calculus, or at least a lot of calculus, can be thought of as generalizations of distance equals rate times time. Here it is, right there. That's like a distance, that's like a rate, that's like a time. Now, they aren't distances, rates, and times. They are interest rates, rate, and price. But the principle is the same. So in this case, this becomes negative point 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.00039 approximately times 10, negative 0. 0.0039. That should be the approximate change in I, is it? Um, I need to redo the N solve here. I'm interested in the new yield rate. I have it down here, actually. I am interested in the new yield rate if I increase the purchase price from 950 to 960. The new yield rates, about 0 0.0548. What's the change in the yield rate? Take that minus the original yield rate. It is, in fact, pretty close to negative 0.003. I know it's hard to concentrate on exactly what I'm doing. You need to listen probably more than watch, but you want to see the final thing does match this product. You may want to watch this part of the video over again, right? These are really important things. This is a really important kind of application. People in finance can use these tools all the time. Because market conditions change all the time. Okay, so again, that's complicated. It's a complicated problem. But the most important thing is that you understand the big picture. On an exam, I would not give you something so complicated. Okay? I'd give you something simpler. But if you understand the concepts and you practice a little bit, make up simpler examples. You know, there are examples in the book. Take the odd problems from that section, 3.7. Do some more of them for the exam. Maybe we'll have time for another review. We'll see how it goes. Let's move on. Introduced this, these theorems last time, the increasing slash decreasing slash constant function theorems. You should know these for the exam as well, in, to the extent that I'm going to talk about them. 
increasing function theorem says if f prime is positive on some open interval from a to b, then f itself, that function is strictly increasing on a closed interval on a slightly bigger domain, actually. This should make good sense, okay? This is saying if the slope of the tangent line is always positive, the function must be going up. What could be more simple sounding? Right? F prime of x gives you the slope of the tangent line. It's always positive. The function of graph has got to be going up. Proving this is actually much harder than you would imagine. And part of the theory in section 3.10, including something you should have read about called the mean value theorem, which I'm not going to test you about in exam two, is to help prove this. fundamental fact. However, you don't want to misinterpret it. There are some subtleties to be aware of. We can come to the subtleties right away here. Let's skip this decreasing function here for the moment. The converses of these theorem are, theorems are technically false, even though they hold true for most examples. What do I mean by converse? I mean Well, for the increasing function theorem, in the following statement. So, yeah, so suppose maybe f is increasing on some interval and f is differentiable on the open interval, then f prime of x would be positive on the open interval. I'm just switching around the roles of what is assumed and what's being concluded. In the theorem on the screen, I assume this was true. Oops, I forgot a greater than zero sign here. In the theorem on the screen, I'm assuming this is true, and I show this is true. I'm just switching those around here. If I assume this is true, is this true? The answer is no, it's not. This is technically false. And you should know that for the exam. But wait a minute, doesn't it sound true? If the graph is going up and the function is smooth, differentiable, shouldn't its derivative be positive everywhere? The answer is no. How could that be? Come up with an example that illustrates that not true. This is the simplest example. x cubed has a graph that is always going up. It's an increasing function over any interval. But its derivative is not always positive. f prime of x is 3x squared. f prime of 0 is 0, which is not a positive number. 0 is not greater than 0. Am I being ticky-tack here? You're like, well, it's almost bigger than zero. It equals zero. This is enough to make this statement false. What's really going on? But you might be saying, well, is it really increasing at zero? Never say a function is increasing at a point. That's a nonsense statement. Okay? When you're wondering if a function is increasing or decreasing, it's always over some interval. The graph of x cubed looks like this. Its graph is always going up, though really, really slowly near the origin. In fact, if, as you zoom in toward the origin, the graph looks more and more horizontal. It never is exactly horizontal. This is the confusing part. It never is exactly horizontal. It just looks more and more horizontal. So much so that its tangent line there is horizontal. Isn't that wild? But true. It is true. Okay. So the point I'm trying to make here is just because something sounds reasonable, this sounds reasonable, like, sure, it must be true. It's, it doesn't have to be true. You can come up with, you might say, nitty gritty, ticky tack examples, whatever phrase you want to use, that can illustrate that it's false. Something possible. And in this case, we can't. 
I want to make you aware of that. It's important to realize that not everything that sounds reasonable is necessarily true. You might say it's mostly true. For most examples, that works. This works. But not for every example. So technically, it's a false statement. It's not something you can prove because it's false. The decreasing function theorem says if the derivative is always negative, the function must be going down. The converse of that is also false. Negative x cubed would be an example illustrating that the converse of this is false. The constant function theorem says if the derivative is always zero, the function must be constant. If the, if the slope of the tangent is always zero, the graph of the function must be horizontal. It must be the same as its tangent line. But wait a minute, is, is this really true? After all, we have seen graphs of functions that look like this. Right, like the greatest integer function, also called the floor function. That function has a derivative always equal to zero, but it's not constant. Or did I say something wrong? Wouldn't the derivative of this always be zero? depends on how, what extra conditions you put on it. If you're talking about the derivative over some interval over which the graph is constant like this, then yes, over that interval the derivative would be constant. But over a bigger interval like this entire interval from here to here, the derivative is not always zero. Why? It's pretty fundamental for the test too. Why? not continuous, right? We talked about how differentiability implies continuity. So therefore, if lack of continuity implies lack of differentiability, it's not, it's not differentiable at these points of jump discontinuities. So to say that derivative is always zero is not true. This theorem would only apply only over small intervals, but not over some bigger interval like this. Applications of the theorems. Got a cubic there. Determine on what intervals the function f is increasing and on what intervals it's decreasing. You should be able to do a problem like this for the test. What do you do? Use the theorem. Take the derivative and see where it's positive and where it's negative. That's what the theorem says to do. The derivative is 6x squared plus 6x minus 12. Where is that zero? You could use the quadratic formula. You also can actually factor it. If you're careful, you can realize it's 6 times in parentheses x plus 2 times x minus 1. It's going to be 0 when x is negative 2 or 1. You could use the quadratic formula like that as well. It's helpful to make a number line and mark the values of x where the derivative is 0 on the number line, negative 2 and 1 in this case. The derivative is only going to change sign, positive to negative or negative to positive, at these numbers. If it does change sign at all. So plugging in numbers in each of the three intervals that these two numbers define, and seeing whether you get a positive or negative derivative helps you answer the question. F prime, for example, of negative 3, you don't actually have to find F prime of negative 3, you just need to decide if it's positive or negative. That's positive. Negative 3 plus 2 is negative. Negative 3 minus 1 is also negative. Positive times negative times negative is positive. This is positive. F itself must be increasing when x is less than negative 2. 
Try a number in here, like what about zero? Positive, positive, negative. F prime of zero is negative. F itself must be decreasing. It's not, I'm drawing straight lines here, but the graph of F is not a straight line. Maybe I should draw it here. Try a number over here, like say two. Positive, positive, positive. This is positive. F is increasing. So to answer the question, you say F is increasing on, well, you could use interval notation if you're comfortable with that. You could write negative infinity to negative 2 and positive 1 to plus infinity. You could also use inequalities. You could say when x is less than or equal to negative 2 and x is greater than or equal to 1. It's increasing on both intervals. So that's why I'm using the word and. It's not that, it's not that these things can be true at the same time. They can't. I'm just saying it's increasing on both intervals. And f is decreasing. on the interval from negative 2 to 1, and I'm writing it as a closed interval. Because the theorem said I could. Which also emphasizes the point that you would never say f is increasing or decreasing at a point, because evidently then, it's somehow both increasing and decreasing at negative 2 and 1. Don't think of it that way. You always describe these things in terms of intervals. Right? So you should be able to do this kind of thing, for example. There's another application. You can stretch if you need to here. Well, okay. What does this mean about local extreme points? I'm not going to test you on extreme points, but let me just briefly tell you what it means. And after exam two, we're going to get into extreme points a lot. You can plug in points here as well. The graph's going to look something about like this. And at negative 2, there's going to be what's called a local maximum. The graph's going to have a high point system. And at 1, there's going to be a local minimum, a low point. The derivative changes sign from positive to negative back to positive. When it changes sign from positive to negative, you have a local high point maximum. When it changes sign from negative to positive, you have a local minimum. Now imagine this is a hill. Okay, and you're skiing down. Here you're in a little valley, and here you've gone back up to a little new top of the, another hill. This is a local minimum, that's a local maximum. I'm not going to test you on that for exam two, but it will come up on exam. Here's another application. Suppose f prime of x always equals g of x, and suppose g prime of x always equals negative f of x. What can you say about the function f of x quantity squared plus g of x quantity squared? What a weird question. Kind of vague. What can you say about it? Well, maybe you can say something about its graph. Is it increasing or decreasing, perhaps? So maybe we should differentiate it, and that's what you should do. What rule do I need when I differentiate this? Chain rule, right? f of x is the inside function, the squaring function is the outside function. f of x gets done first, squaring gets done second. Chain rule says take the derivative of the outside, x squared, to get 2x. But then plug in the inside function into that. Then multiply times the derivative of the inside function. There's the chain. Similar thing would happen with the g. I'm letting h of x, by the way, equal f of x squared plus g of x squared. Same kind of thing would happen when you differentiate this part. You'd get the same kind of thing. So what? What should I do now? Use your assumptions. I wouldn't put them there if I didn't mean for you to use them. How? Replace them. 
replace f prime with g of x and replace g prime of x with that negative f. What happens? Something magical happens. Really? Yes, really. Everything cancels. This becomes a big zero. They cancel. Right? It's like 5 minus 5 is 0. For all x, it didn't matter what x is. What does this mean? By the constant function theorem, each must be constant. And what if h of 0 were 0? If I add an extra assumption here, what could you say about this? You could say f of x squared plus g of x squared would always equal h of x, which is always 1 for all x. What does this remind you of? And maybe one of these remind you of? Sine and cosine. Sine and cosine, yeah. These functions are the sine and cosine, at least if I make this extra assumption. I guess f of x must be sine of x, and g of x must be cosine of x, because the derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. I can verify the Pythagorean identity for trig functions using calculus. General review. Somebody remind me at the end of class to go ahead and put this on the shared drive. So you don't necessarily have to write this stuff down. What should you know, understand, and be able to do? There's the limit definition of the root. Even though we talked about infinitesimals, I still want you to be able to do limit calculations. Four examples. So if I asked you, or if I said, <coughs> let f of x be x cubed, and I said verify f prime of x is 3x squared with the definition of the derivative, you should be able to do it. You have to start this way. Go back to the limit as h goes to 0 of the difference quotient, our standard difference quotient. You could be able to do it for an arbitrary value of x. You might have to do it for a particular value of x. And you should be able to give reasons for the steps this time. I mentioned that after exam 1. I said you should be able to give reasons for the steps. A couple of the last reasons involved the fact that the limit doesn't depend on what happens to the function when h actually equals 0, right? Because limits doesn't matter what happens to the function at that number. Think of this as a function of h. And there was another reason, another step that required continuity at the end. After cancellation of h's, you end up with a continuous function of h. You end up plugging in h equals 0 at the end, and that required continuity. The other steps were typically, well, the definition of the derivative and then algebra. The other steps. Simplification, those are the kinds of words you can use. What section is that in? Uh, mostly that? section is 2.2 and 2.3, mostly. Now, the definition of average and instantaneous speeds and also of average and instantaneous velocities. And be able to interpret these in a purely visual way. And as a rate of change. Remember also that you think about distance traveled and speed in a sense only one dimensionally. It's not that you can't travel back and forth when thinking about such things, but it's simpler to think about it in one direction. <coughs> How far did I go um, as a function of time? 
its derivative I call the speed. Position is not how far I went, it's what's my position with respect to some reference point, say the edge of this desk here, with some direction like that direction being positive and some direction being negative. I could be at a negative position after a certain amount of time. The derivative of a position is velocity. Velocity can also be positive and negative. If that's my setup, if the positive direction is that way and the negative direction is that way, when I walk this way, I've got a positive velocity. When I walk back this way, I have a negative velocity. The negative sign is just keeping track of the direction. And the derivative of velocity is acceleration as well. Be able to use rules for derivatives like linearity and power rule, etc., to find velocities and accelerations, and including the example we did today with free fall. And more general examples. The free fall example is pretty special. It's a very special situation. The acceleration is constant. In reality, when you're driving a car, the acceleration is not constant. And be able to solve for when the velocity is zero. We already talked about that with the free fall. You throw something straight up, just be able to figure out when it reaches the peak before it starts coming back down. Um, the time when that happens is was v0 over g, was that what it was? I think. And then you can find the maximum height by plugging that into the height function. Once you've got that. Yeah, that's what I'm referring to. You should also be able to use the quadratic formula to figure out when the object hits the ground, for example, assuming the ground is at height zero. If you get a graph of a function, be able to quickly rough, uh, sketch a rough graph of its derivative and second derivative. So we did an example like that in class where I had you work on it before class, and then we went over it together. So your function looks something like that. Yikes. Where is the derivative negative? It's negative when the function is decreasing over here. Graph's going down. Also between here and here, it's going down. Also over here, it's going down. So the graph of the derivative would be negative. Here, here, and here. And it would be positive when the graph's going up. Here and here. And it's zero when the graph has a horizontal tangent. There. You did pretty well on that for the activity we did in class. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what section that is? Section 2.3. Trying to graph the second derivative means you've got the graph of the first derivative and you look at its, its slopes. Where are they positive and where are they negative? And ultimately would correspond to this graph, the original function being concave up versus concave down. It's concave up. From here to about right there or so, there's an inflection point. Where the graph changes from a smile to a frown. It's concave down in here till maybe right around there somewhere. I tried to estimate these things exactly. Concave up in here. Concave down the rest of the graph. Probably would not have you do both because it would just take too much time. Uh, too easy to make a mistake. Probably we just have you sketch one of them. But you should understand the idea. Be able to estimate derivatives numerically based on function values coming from table C. On the old exam that I posted, there was a problem like that. And you'll see in my explanation of the answers that I say sometimes take an average of the slopes of two secant lines, and sometimes at the end points, just the slope of one secant line. You're just given data. Maybe the data looks like this with the graph. There's some underlying function, but you don't know its formula. You can estimate the slope of the tangent right there by averaging slopes of secant lines. Take this secant line right there and this secant line right there, find their slopes and average. 
That's what you'll be doing if you look at that problem in the field example. For this point, however, there's only one secant line you can use, the one to the right, because it's a left hand line. Interpreting the derivative as a rate of change mostly here. Using units, give approximations. The derivative always has units. If your original function, y is a function of x, the units for the derivative are units for slope, rise over run, which are units for y per unit of x. It's always that way. And so in real life applications, you've got to think about that to help you interpret that. We did plenty of examples like that. Like the drug dosage and what else? The weight, yep. the weight of the person. The drug dosage depends on the weight. The fuel efficiency depends on the speed. There are a lot of examples we consider. Okay. Real life meaning, including the sign. Why is the derivative positive? And what does that mean? Why is it negative? Or it's negative. What does that mean? Think about like the mass and the spring. Period, how long it takes to go back and forth one time, depending on both the mass itself, m and k, the spring constant. The derivative of the period with respect to the mass. Get a big, bigger object, it's probably going to go slower as a bigger period. The derivative of t with respect to m is positive. Bigger mass is given bigger periods. With respect to k, though, the derivative is negative. A stronger springs that have more restoring force result typically in faster oscillations with a lower period. Thinking about it intuitively can help you. Be comfortable with Leibniz notation? Second derivatives, <coughs> be able to compute and give meaning to those <coughs> as well, and also the Leibniz notation there. Differentiability. What did differentiability mean? Function is differentiable at a point if what? Say it louder. Continuous and smooth. Continuous and smooth. Yeah, I mean, more simply, the derivative exists. And that will imply continuity and smoothness. <coughs> That's the definition. Differentiability implies continuity. Therefore, when you have lack of continuity, you also have lack of differentiability. Like a jump discontinuity is like with the, the floor function, for example. F prime is not always zero because F prime doesn't always exist. Local linearity, differentiability is equivalent in calculus one at least to local linearity. The graph looks more and more like a non vertical straight line as you zoom in closer and closer. You should know that the graph of the cube root function, even though it's smooth in the sense that there's no corners, fails to be differentiable at zero because as you zoom in closer and closer, the tangent line is vertical. The slope is infinite in the sense, and therefore we also say it's not differentiable. Avoid infinite slopes too. Even though there's no corner, we still say it's not differentiable. Tangent line approximations, those are linear approximations. That's the, that's the distance equals right times time. The general approximate equation is delta y is approximately f prime of x times delta x. You're imagining you've got some specific number x that you're at, perhaps you call it a, and you let x change a little bit by delta x. How much does y change? Approximately by this product. This is the generalization of distance equals right times time. You can also write this in other ways. Maybe you can write it this way. This is the change in y. There's the derivative, so I'm thinking of a as being something specific here. You can write it that way. It's the same approximate equation, just different symbols. And you can solve for f of x. You know, we've written this approximate equation a lot recently. Be able to use that to find 
Tangent line approximations, local linearizations, they're called. We've been doing that a lot recently. These are going to be good approximations. I talked about what that means. I think I'm not going to test you with what it means to be a good approximation. But we did have that expression of error that we talked about last Friday. Stay awake? Some people are not. The things I say are, are truly key. I mean, you know, giving you the exact kind of way to think about these things that was going to be helpful if you can really focus. Some general derivative facts to know and be able to use and be able to derive, at least the ones we did in class. Linearity, the derivative of a linear combination, the linear combination of the derivatives. dx of, say, a times f of x plus b times g of x. A and B are constants is A times F prime of X plus B times G prime of X. The fundamental property of derivatives, and it has a lot of applications, you could even say, past calculus. It's fundamental in engineering, for example. When things are linear, that, that makes things work nicely. We like linear things. Physics, you'll hear it sometimes described as what's called the superposition principle, often used with waves. Some generalization of this. Product rule, lefty right plus righty left. Quotient rule, low D high minus high D low over the square of what's below. There were a few of you on the gateway that just forgot to divide by the square of what's below. Quotient rule above. Don't forget that. Chain rule, the derivative of the outside plug in the inside times the derivative of the inside. Specific derivative facts for power rule, the derivative of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1. Keep track of the fact that the variable there is not in the exponents, in the base. n is fixed. That's different than an exponential function. The derivative of an exponential function, an arbitrary b to the x is natural log of b times b to the x. The x is in the exponent. And this is, of course, nice. Nicest when b equals e. We're almost out of time. I'm going to go quick here. Derivatives of trig functions, logarithmic functions, and inverse trig functions, also called arc functions. Gateway stuff that you probably should practice some more, even if you pass the gateway. Derivations using infinitesimals. What did we do there? We did like specific examples like x squared and x cubed. We did sine and cosine that way too, though that was trickier. Probably if I had you do a derivation with differentials, infinitesimals, um, it would be a, like x squared or x cubed, something like that. Partial derivatives, please don't zip it up too quick, it's just distracting. Thanks. Partial derivatives, you have more than one independent variable. You can use the partial derivative notation just to emphasize that. Though you, I'm not requiring that. You can use ordinary derivative notation if that makes you happier. Um, and finally, this is the last slide. There's logarithmic differentiation. We didn't explicitly discuss this in the book, but we did in class. We did x to the x, for example, in class. It's worth talking about, so I could put something like that in there. I'll probably write up another example for you to look at. So you can see another example. I'll maybe write up another example of implicit differentiation. Tangent line approximations, I've talked about that. Error, you should be able to graph the error, for example, and approximate it with that, that box that was in the book. Page 171, where there was an approximation to the error function. And these theorems that we've been talking about recently, antiderivatives and applications. Okay. So like in the first exam, there is a lot, OK? Um, but again, think of the, studying for the exam as a learning opportunity. You're studying, so you want to get things in your mind better. You can use a note card again, front and back. But I, I highly suggest doing enough problems that you feel good that you can do them without a note card. Because the note cards, they're mostly just to reduce anxiety. 
We want to know it well enough that you can do it without a number. Okay? I'll be available pretty much all day tomorrow with office hours. See you Wednesday.